over here. All right. So this is Stephen Downs, November 28, 2020. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be with all of you here today. The title of this presentation is Being Online, Facing the Digital Future Together. And uh, I've got a bunch of stuff I want to talk about, but you know, the, the context that we're in uh, is the context of the pandemic. Text is backwards. Oh, joy. Okay, let me fix that. <laughs> oh, there's always something, isn't there? It's virtual cam. How's that? That should be better. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> so that's pretty funny. Um, so uh, let, let's, for the people who had to look at that backwards, here's the title screen again, uh, all beautiful. And that's my cat, Charlemagne, there on the screen. Um, anyhow, so we're in the context of this pandemic and What's happened, as I'm sure you all know, uh, is that over the last, what is it now, eight months, um, there's been a rediscovery of what we're calling remote learning these days, or hybrid learning sometimes. Um, and it's almost as though we're rediscovering what online learning is all about. It's been a very interesting kind of thing and of course, now that we're several months in, uh, we're into the point where people are drawing the lessons learned. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm sure many of you have been doing this for a long time. I mean, it's hard to offer uh, home learning if you don't. So, you know, a lot of these lessons are things that we might already know. But on the other hand, I find it useful to revisit these lessons that we're learning and, and look at them in a new light. So it's not 2003 anymore. It's 2020. We know we've learned these lessons before, but these are new to a lot of people out there. They're new to our learners and they're new to a lot of first time educators. So that's the way I'm going to approach this talk. That's the, the, the theme, if you will, that I'm going to follow in this presentation. And, and so we have the abstract that I promised you. I'm not generally good at delivering on what I promised in my abstracts, but this time we're going to be pretty close to what the abstract actually promised. Hello, I'm Salem Mahmoud, 12 years old, studying in Al Mutanabi, 6 Elite, in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. I feel alright about not studying at school or not being at school, but it's quite different. Well, oh, Stephen, we can't hear the, the audio. Can't hear the audio, of course and not. My teachers, <laughs> the science experimentations we do, okay. and obviously the food. So one of the things that I've learned over time is the best laid plans sometimes fail. That should have worked. I don't know why it didn't work, um, but okay. I think there's a little there's a little button just to click when you share that video down in the left hand corner in Zoom that says share audio. Uh, it went, it, yeah. It down in the left hand corner oh i'm not even in i'm gonna have to skip it okay. I, I can't fix it on the fly so okay this is uh this is adapting to things in real time i'm sorry but okay um there it was um and if you want to see that video and the others that i had planned to show you uh, they are available and come on and they're available on uh, this website it's a UNESCO website um, uh, basically getting 
responses from people uh, who are trying to learn during the pandemic. I thought it'd be a nice thing to add, but yeah, no sound. I didn't have a chance to test on Zoom, so I had to try to, anyhow, never mind. Uh, sometimes, it's funny because I was introduced as an expert. Sometimes the definite of expert is, has made lots of mistakes, bracket, will continue to make mistakes. <laughs> Um, and, uh, of course I can share the links in the chat. I thought it was a nice site and, and I liked the comments a lot. So there's, a, there's the link in the chat for y'all. Okay. Back to the PowerPoint and, uh, so, oh my goodness, why is is the sizing all wrong? That's why. Uh, so the big lesson that I took away from this is it's hard at first. Um, and I think that's a worthwhile lesson to be taking away from this. Uh, you know, and, and we've seen that in a lot of the studies and evaluations. Um, and it's interesting because uh, you know, despite some of the talk about, oh no, people are going to fall way behind in their learning, uh, the grades seem to be coming out about the same online as offline, which would be consistent with 20 or 30 years of practice. But students find it harder. They find it takes, everything takes longer online. But the main lesson is it gets easier. Of course, in a sense, it doesn't get easier because you keep trying to do new things, as I've been trying to do here. But, of course, you know, as you get more familiar with the system, it does get easier. And my own experience is that uh, as time goes by, as it gets easier, I find I can do more and more online. And ultimately, in many ways, the learning becomes better online than offline. Oops. The other thing is, and I'm sure all of you know this, but it, it really bears repeating. Uh, you know, you, you can't just replicate what you do in real life, right? Uh, in real life, I'd stand at the front of the room like this with the slide deck on the wall and just talk at you. And, you know, I'm a pretty experienced speaker. I can, you know, draw from your reactions and all of that. Uh, I can banter back and forth. A lot of that's harder online. But what that means is that online, we have to do different things. Uh, we, we have to be bringing in other activities. We have to be breaking up the flow. That's what I was trying to do with those videos, right? There were little punctuation marks through the presentation. I'm really annoyed that the audio didn't work. <laughs> um, so, and you can't just emulate, you know, this is, this is, this illustrations from the Royal Society, uh, a blog on teaching during the lockdown. They have a kid using a paper and pencil while learning online. Why are they doing that, right? Um, and, you know, and I'm seeing from Elizabeth, in many boards, this is exactly the expectation. You will teach in class and do the same materials online, often at the same time. Yeah, and that's a lesson that we've learned. Don't do that. It comes up later. So frustrating. Exactly. You know, commit to the online commit to using the computer. Uh, it takes a bit of getting used to, but ultimately it gets easier. Another thing, it's not all business. Um, there, there needs to be a little bit of socialization and chit chat. Uh, take this presentation. I logged on at 10 and soon we're right into the talk. Right. Uh, if we had done that better, and I'm not blaming anybody because I should have thought of this ahead of time. 
All right. But if we had done that better, we would have given me 10 minutes to try things out, 10 minutes to banter with people, to find out where you're at. Why? Because that's what I do in person. And the reason why I do that is I get a feel for where you're at, for what things are like where in your world. Um, you know, uh, I get a sense of how you speak, uh, how you interact. Every group is different. Um, and also, it makes it more fun. Um, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing is part of what makes learning human. And as a result, you know, when, when we just jump into let's stay on topic, stay on task, all of that, that takes the, 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 the human personal element out of it. And there's no reason to do that. There's no reason to take it out. It's just you have to make time for it. There's another one of the, you know, it's going to use those as punctuation. It's still kind of like punctuation, right? Because we can pause now. And um, the the previous one, there was a funny remark. The, uh, the student said, you know, I, I miss lots of things about school, especially the food. Right? That just, I love that. Uh, this one, you know, when I'm not studying, I jump on the trampoline. And we have pictures of her jumping on her trampoline. Uh, which is too bad. It's, anyhow, you can go see those. Punctuation. I like punctuation. I also have a cat playing with my speaker wire or my microphone wire. So here's my wire and I have a cat because of course I have a cat. Okay. The other big thing uh in uh, remote learning or online learning is the need for support uh, for online learning staff. Daniela saying, I have three, yay. <laughs> um, so there, there's, I think, two aspects to that. Um, there's one aspect in the sense that, um, you know, they, they need training or at least, you know, some place to learn how the browser works, how Zoom works, how the learning management system works, if that's what you're using, how document sharing works, how you can upload assignments, record video and all of that. And all of that. Uh, Valentina respects dogs, but her heart belongs to cats. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I respect dogs too. Oops, she jumped and missed. <laughs> um, the other side of it is, you can try again. It's okay. Uh, the other side of it is that, um, you know, traditionally people, including teachers and instructors, have relied on classes and courses to learn. But things are moving too fast for that now. New technology comes on stream all the time, new approaches, new pedagogies. Uh, so it becomes incumbent on instructional staff to learn how to learn for themselves. And I know that is almost counter to everything they do, but that's what's needed, right? Um, you know, again, uh, another definition of being an expert. Learned how to learn on his own. So that way I don't need to take classes that allows me to stay ahead of the classes. Um, and, and I think this is going to be an important aspect of, uh, you know, keeping up with the technology in the future. Another aspect of uh, supporting online staff recommended practice here is don't just throw staff into the lurch on their own. Um, Again, despite appearances here, uh, recommended practice is to have a tech or support person working alongside. And the reason for that, as you watch this video, should be evident. Uh, the reason for that is it's really hard to focus on giving a talk, moving through the content, interacting with the audience, and also doing all the hands-on tech stuff. Like every time you see me turn away like this, I'm looking at my other monitor screen. See, I have the uh, the big monitor here. 
So I'm looking at my other monitor to advance my slides, to set up my browser, whatever, right? It's really hard to do all of that at once. So it's better um, if you can have a couple of people doing the work at the same time. Now, of course, in today's socially distant environment, that introduces complications of its, uh, on its own. Uh, I was doing a presentation yesterday where I did have the support. Somebody else was managing all of that for me, but we had to work out a plan ahead of time. So I said, you know, okay, we're going to start the video, then you'll switch over to the slide. And then when I advance this slide, we'll stay on the slide for five to 10 seconds and switch back to the video, unless I advance really fast. No matter what I do, if I advance the slide, the counter starts over again, and we'll stay on the slide for five to 10. You see what I mean? <laughs> you, need, you need to coordinate it a bit in advance. Um, so going into it, like, you know, doing it live, I think, and I, I think I have a slide to this effect later, is best. I like doing it live, but you got to have a plan. And then you have to prepare for the plan to fall apart while you're doing the presentation. And it helps to have some backup and some support with respect to that. Even somebody saying, your text is backwards. We're not hearing the audio. You see how important that is? Uh, yeah, lesson in practice there. And as you can see now, I'm turning aside to advance my slide. Then I'll come back here, flip on PowerPoint only, and you'll see the next slide, which talks about the value of life. Uh, that's not my cat. That's someone else's cat. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there is a value in hosting live classes. Um, you know, the live has this different kind of feel. That's why I like it. If you guys are watching, don't feel you're distracting me if you type into the chat. I like seeing the chat. I've got it right there on my screen. So, um, you know, I've, I've got my, my presenter and the chat right there. I'll be able to see the chat. So, yeah, like uh, Inara says, two parrots watching with me. Perfect. Um, Polly want a cracker? No. <laughs> uh, I was trying to think of something that you wouldn't want your parrot to say. <laughs> and then try to train your parrot. <laughs> right. Uh, I shouldn't do that. Okay. What do we got next? Open media. I love open media. Uh, people who are just going online now, uh, just like back in the 1990s and 2000s, um, they begin by thinking, okay, I have to, I have to do everything myself. I have to make all of my content. I have to create my own images or illustrations, uh, etc. Over 20, 25 years, a huge body of open resources has been created such that we can draw from that. I do draw from that. Pretty much any talk or any presentation or any learning event I've ever done has drawn from the wealth of material that's online. Now, again, it's harder at first, right? It's harder to find things at first. But once you get good at finding them, once you have your go-to sources, uh, once you've trained Google, uh, Google search to respond to the sort of things that you search for, um, you know, then it gets a lot easier. Uh, we have Tula saying about live, this is so true with our students who are often very isolated in their communities as newcomers to Canada. Absolutely. Live makes connections. Uh, open resources, that's the language or the tool that you use to make these connections. A lot of times these open resources will cross linguistic and cultural boundaries, especially if you use things like memes or, you know, in commonly shared images, uh, it'll be a touch point because they may well have seen it before. They might not have, I mean, you never know, right? Uh, nonetheless, and the other thing too, and, and it's on the slide here, um, when you're producing resources, uh, 
or sorry, when you're presenting or interacting or working to provide learning, think about creating these resources. Uh, this session here is being recorded. You know, a year ago, people weren't doing that. They weren't recording these presentations. Well, except me uh, and, and a few other people, but mostly we weren't doing that. But now we want to record the Zoom. We also want to record the audio. And that's why on my phone, I have a separate audio recording on the go. And the neat thing about using my phone, see there it goes. The neat thing about using my phone is I'm, I'm using a Google Pixel. So it does an automated transcription. So I can't show you the transcription right here, but I will be able to put the transcription of this event into a blog post later on. And in fact, that's exactly what I'll do. Back to the slides. More on using open media. Um, so open educational resources, widely available, etc but also creating the resources. Over time, it really adds up. This is a, a quote from the Royal Society paper. Uh, they've created 45 gigabytes of remote learning resources with 170,000 remote uh, resource views. My production is similar, believe it or not. And I don't even make an effort because 45 gigabytes, that's like 45 hours of video instruction. It's not that much. Um, you know, and I've done quite a few of these presentations, so start adding up the gigabytes. Um, uh, oh, and uh, Karen Lee in the chat is offering us a definition of memes, thanks to her 18-year-old. I won't read it because it's fairly long, but still nice. Um, continuing. Uh, so... The thing about open media, too, is often uh, communities develop around uh, these open media networks or repositories. Uh, here's something, the Caribbean Examinations Council Learning Hub, right? And, and, you know, countries in the Caribbean, Belize, Jamaica, others, uh, use this resource, share these resources, and are able to support each other. Uh, you will find, if you haven't already, that the language learning community similarly has a large body of open educational resources. Um, and the thing to do is to look at look for that, tap into that. A good exercise right now even is to ask yourself, what, re what open resources do I know about already? Because you may well, right? You, you know, um, have I shared those with everybody else? Um, uh, am I part of a community creating and sharing these open educational resources? Because it just adds so much value. Uh, now there's a caution, and uh, I, I threw in a couple of GeoCity sites there so that you could enjoy the awfulness along with me. Uh, and this is in a thing by Tony Bates. And the caution is that the quality might not be there in open educational resources. Now, I find that a really mixed argument. Um, okay, everybody likes higher quality. But higher quality is one of these things for which there are diminishing returns. Um the video quality of this presentation is not the same as a feature film. But it doesn't need to be because presumably you're not paying, uh, well, maybe you are, I don't know what you're paying. Uh, but presumably, uh, you know, we're not trying to drive hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue from this presentation. First of all, there isn't the audience for it. But secondly, uh, no one, wow, oh, Tim Eric, nice. No one wants to be seen in HD. Well, that's a pretty good point. I mean, look at this. There's a reason why they hire professional actors uh, for these things. Um, but Elizabeth is saying you do have to vet things to be sure. Right. I would not have tried showing those little videos that I had planned to show without having looked at them first. Now, I know they're on a UNESCO site and all of that, but just in case, uh, you know. Um, so, yeah. 
Uh, so, you know, people talk about quality. Quality is not the only thing. And it's mostly about preventing the awful than achieving the perfect. There, there, there's, that's a, a clip and save kind of remark, isn't it? Prevent the awful instead of achieving the perfect. I have to remember that. Okay, so there was a... This one had music. <laughs> uh, had a musical background. I'm sorry. Uh, beyond the broadcast. Um, we all heard stories, I think, of horror stories of people having four hours, six hours, eight hours of Zoom sessions. Um, sometimes at conferences, just more often, in fact, you know, taking classes online as part of emergency remote learning. Nobody should have to do that. I mean, imagine sitting down and watching all three parts of Lord of the Rings back to back to back. Now, that's as good video as you're ever going to see but it's too much right um and and similarly with online learning you have to take it outside the computer environment you have to break you know break it up etc now i've read a few things and you'll probably see it well you should break up your presentation by doing quizzes or whatever no because all you're doing is more on-screen stuff, right? That, it doesn't break anything up. Um, so really what you want to do is uh, use the on-screen time for stuff like this, like this presentation, maybe for conversation, interaction. Oh, Elizabeth saying back to back to back is not a problem for her 13-year-old. Okay point made and video games are like that too I, i've i've done 20 hour video game sessions i sorry to admit that but it's true <laughs> uh, but you know not everybody can do it um and and most people shouldn't <laughs> so but the idea here is that use the online for what online is good for but then get people offline doing other things now that's harder during a pandemic than otherwise but whether or not we're in a pandemic it's still good advice um you know the and, and it's funny i gave a talk in i don't know 2001 um about a boat called the tribal warrior in australia and the idea here was that the people uh on the boat were at-risk youth and they were learning online but the whole point of learning online was so that they could get out of the classroom and onto the boat and learn through real life experience working as a team traveling interacting doing teachings um you see the difference so i see online learning as the way to get out of the classroom and into the community or into the environment rather than as a way of just emulating the classroom. And I think that's a really important lesson that I think that, you know, especially the new remote teaching practitioners, they have yet to learn that and, and they need to learn that, I think. Okay, this is a big one, especially for those of us who work online Oh, I took my online class camping, says Karen. I borrowed a hotspot from the library. I love that. That's perfect. Yeah. And, and yeah, I love that. I should do that. I, I should set up a little campsite in my backyard. <laughs> uh, Linda says, echoing everybody's sentiment, Karen is the best. <laughs> um, so um working and learning at home requires that you set routines for yourself now everybody has different routines and we're not necessarily talking about military drill here but we're talking about expectations right um expectations on the part of the instructor expectations on the part of the learners and and the idea here is to it, you know, it isn't discipline it's not about discipline 
It's not about compliance. It's about creating habits. And a habit takes a certain amount of time to form. You know, you, you, you might decide, as I did once a long time ago, yes, I am going to eat breakfast every day. Um, because I wanted, I was one of those horrible students, didn't eat breakfast, had a coffee, dragged myself into class. And I decided, no, nope, I'm going to eat breakfast every day. But then you have to force yourself to do it for a while. Now it's just habit. I just do it. I have my oatmeal, my fruit, my maple syrup. And, uh, but back then, it was a big thing and it took a while. And that's the purpose of providing, you know, a loose schedule, um, you know, a way of prioritizing. A, and then you share it with people. Things happen. Sometimes you break the schedule. Um, but, you know, and create balance in the schedule so that people don't go nuts working. I have a cat clawing on my leg. <laughs> um, she wants up again. No? I think she wants out, but I'm not sure. Kitty. And you haven't seen the cat yet, so this could all be fake. How, how would you know? <laughs> okay, how are we doing? 1037. Uh, another big lesson that was learned um, was access and equity. As soon as we went online, the problems began to show up. Now, access and equity works both ways. And people didn't talk about uh, how in-person learning also creates access and equity issues. Now, you guys did. I mean, like uh, being able to learn at home is a benefit to the program that you guys offer. But, you know, if, for most of the educational system, they haven't been talking that way, which is an issue. So online learning can increase access, but it also shows where we run into issues of access. Come on, you can do it, kitty. Come on, there we go. There, real live cat. <laughs> She's struggling to get up onto the... Uh, to the desk okay um, so you know there's two sides here right there's the the difficulty of access in person and there's the difficulty of access online but in my view frankly it's easier to address the difficulties of moving online uh, there's other aspects to access, right? Um, the sense of ensuring that people uh, with disabilities have alternatives. Uh, the sense of engaging people who may have mental health issues. And so access means not just providing extra tools or support to learners. It also means providing yourself the extra tools and support that you need in order to be able to adapt. Uh, I, for example, have the good fortune of working with people like Yuta Trevoranis, uh, who's an expert, a Canadian expert in access related issues. Um, and hopefully um, your, uh, your work environment provides you with access to people who will help you manage different aspects of of access and as well in 2020 we saw we were all there uh, a whole bunch of issues come to light with respect to race culture language gender and more and all of these are things that overflow into your uh, teaching and learning experience and and things that need to be thought about need to be addressed in the online environment well, for that matter, in any teaching environment. Um, in online, we have something called the uh, uh, Universal Design for Learning. Uh, not UDDL, just UDL. Um, and, uh, you know, there, it's a whole framework. And you, you might uh, consider going to that Um uh, that web page, but basically the framework is based on the ideas of providing multiple means of engagement 
you know, that's why we talk, we have the chat room, maybe there's a Twitter feed in the background, a synchronous communication, asynchronous communication, uh, video, audio, text, uh, multiple means of representation, um, which is why I'm providing video, uh, you know, like visual uh, slides here like this, plus the audio track that you're listening to. And, you know, if I was better at doing this, I'd be providing more. And then mul the other thing, multiple means of action and expression. Uh, learning isn't, as you know, learning isn't just sitting there. You have to practice. But practice isn't just, you know, repeating your verbs over and over again. I am, you are, he is, she is. Now, there is some element to that. When I was learning French, I spent a long time going through all the vowel sounds. Uh, ooh, uh, ooh, uh, uh, which was really boring. But was for me was absolutely crucial to getting the accent right. Um, you know, so there is that element of rote, but there is that element of putting yourself in practice. I actually learned French, learned French for the first time when uh, I committed myself to give a talk in French to a Francophone audience in uh, Northwestern New Brunswick. And the work of preparing that talk, of rehearsing it, etc., uh, actually gave me the confidence that, yes, I can do this. And I remember still to this moment, clear as day, walking into the front door of the school. It was a school in Clare. And, uh, you know, introducing myself, having a quick interaction. And... Uh, it was all in French, and I realized, hey, I can do this. <laughs> and, and that took away all the fear that I had actually giving the talk. And, uh, yeah, it was one of the greatest learning experiences of my life. So, you know, something like that can be transformative. And I know that that's what you guys do. Uh, and so underlining the importance of having these different activities is a key part of that and that's something that we need to take back to the remote learning community and, and to say very clearly look you got to do more than just talking on zoom even if you interrupt it with little quizzes right so uh the another aspect to access is broadening the reach. Um, and I imagine that you all encounter this as well. Uh, you know, what, back when massive open online courses started, everybody commented that, oh yeah, they're only being taken by masters and PhD graduates, right? And, you know, they're not really for the common person. And that's because they were in subjects like pedagogy, artificial intelligence, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, etc. Um, and they weren't in practical day-to-day -day things like carpentry, plumbing, etc. Now, there are tons of those kind of resources on YouTube, and I know people use them because you just look at the views, right? You know, a million views on a plumbing video tells you something. Um, but that also means that when we're thinking about access in online learning, properly so-called, that we need to be thinking about broadening the reach. We're not just doing academic topics. We're doing a wide range of topics. Uh, Karen saying, my husband had a hard time with two semesters of online welding. Yeah, that can be a challenge, I'm sure. I studied welding once. I know it's a challenge. Uh, I didn't study it online, though. I studied it in, in person, and it was hard. So, yeah. Um, you know, online welding. <laughs> you need the lab. And that's the thing, right, about access is people have to have these tools. They have to have these resources. Uh, you know, they have to have the things that they need. So if you're learning skiing, you have to have snow. <laughs> Um, you know, even if you have to make it yourself, uh, you, you, you need to make sure people have the tools that they need. See, see how well that would have fit. That would have been so great. It would have been perfect, but no, um, 
Oh, well. The other thing is motivation matters. Um, it matters much more online than offline. Uh, you can't force people or convince people the online the way you can offline. Um, and there are different skills, right? Uh, people have to be self-motivated. They have to be autonomous learners. Again, this is all part of, please don't touch my phone, Kitty. Uh, these, these are all part of how it's hard at first to, to do online learning, right? Because you need these skills. Once you have them, things go a lot more smoothly. And the other thing is the reason why it's hard is it's harder to get people to do things they don't want to do online. And, you know, I'm talking about grade 12 math, for example. Um, that's going to be hard if the person's just not interested in math. So here's another way in which it's harder uh, is what they call reading the room. And, you know, it's hard to read the room. Um, Right now, I've got two computer screens here and a cat, and I can't really see how you're reacting. I, I suppose I could if I went back to this session or if I went back to um, the gallery view and looked to see if you're still paying attention. Now I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, it's harder. And you have to make a special effort. And that, that special effort, oops, I've accidentally closed, there we go. Uh, that special effort has to mean taking time to ask people questions, to, to rely on things like the chat. And so uh, to uh, someone whose name is covered up, uh, Laverne Young Clark, uh, who said, thank you, I'm enjoying this session. Thank you for saying that. That really helps, you know, because, um, you know, when I'm teaching online, I can't hear the snoring in the background. There's another quote to keep. <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, and I've learned this the hard way, too. You can't, in an online session, ask for volunteers doesn't work people feel put on the spot you're much more on the spot in the video conference than you are in the classroom that may seem odd but I think it's true um, so you know these these polling things uh, I can't hear you laugh either that's true yes um, so and that's a, that might be a good thing because when I was teaching in person you know there's uh, the inner comedian in all of us especially me and once I get laughter it's hard not to stop anyhow um, so you need to do things to read the room you also need and, and I think people learned this uh, you need to recognize learner realities as well um, that's always been true uh, it used to be easier to do in person because you can see how they're dressed. You can see if they're coming in late all the time. You can see if they're tired. Um, and also different realities come into play in the online environment. Um, which polling tools work best in Zoom? No idea. Haven't used polling tools. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, again, it's this uh, Mentimeter. Okay, Kim says Mentimeter. All right. Um, I'm just not a polling kind of person. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a quantity kind of person. I like chat. I love chat comments, but I'm not keen on, you know, pick one of these three options. That's just me. But I, I think, you know, actual feedback works better online. Uh, so some people like Tony Bates and others say, well, you need to collect data from individual learners. Um, I think it's more you need to interact with them. Don't, you know, I, I was going to say don't collect data. I suppose you should collect data, but but don't think of it in terms of collecting data. Think of it in terms of I'm learning about the people I'm interacting with, like, you know, time zones, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, another thing 
that I saw in quite a few of the studies that I looked at, uh, I've classified it under the heading of it takes a village. Now, a lot of them were saying things like uh, it takes a family. Uh, and I wanted to broaden it from family because we're not always going to be living in these pandemic times. And I really do believe that it takes more than just a family to support learning online for a person. I think it does take, you know, the whole community. It's hard to explain in the time that I have. But again, if we're able to take learning out of the, cl out of the classroom, off of the video, um then we're able to, you know, we're, we're out there in that environment. And in important ways, that environment needs to be receptive to learning. That's one of the things that made my, my study of French going to Claire so effective was that people were, you know, they knew I was an English guy coming in. I had moved to New Brunswick from Alberta. So there you go. And uh, moved to New Brunswick from Alberta, English guy coming in, speaking French. They appreciated that. I knew that. Uh, yeah, I love Alberta. Uh, love Alberta. Um, and, uh, you know, they appreciated it. By contrast, not all of my experiences learning French have been so good. Uh, in the sense that I go to some place... I speak French. I'm not perfect. They switch to English. That's really depressing. <laughs> so, you know, how the community reacts and supports uh, learning is really important. Um, now, I just want to come back to something Diane said. Uh, usually only about 20% actually participate in the chat, polls, quizzes, etc. reach more people. That depends, I think, on your definition of reach. Maybe more people are reading the chat than are just typing in chat. Now, um, but but I, I take your point, right? Uh, I'm getting feedback only from a few people in the chat, etc. Seven minute time check. Thank you. And 40 slides to go. <laughs> Not quite, but still, of course, I'm running behind because it wouldn't be one of my talks if I wasn't running behind. Uh, okay. But I think we're doing okay. Uh, and uh, that that was such a good one, too. I'm, I'm really sorry we missed that one. You, you should go listen to her. She's great. Um, flexible assessment is something that a lot of people looked at. There's been a huge row in the online learning world about the use of proctoring systems like ProctorU or Proctorio and and so much so that these companies have actually begun to do things like sue people who are uh, arguing against them. Um, you know, and students hate them. Uh, Sarah says quite accurately that stuff is evil. So if your learning is depending on proctoring, I think there's something fundamentally wrong. Zoom polls work well, says uh, Diane. Uh, not going to let it go. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, you know, there online, there are so many other things you can do besides tests, right? You can look at other indicators of progress. You can look at things that they've done, things that they say in the discussions and the chats. Uh, you know, you have to get them to contribute, but now if contributing becomes, you know, kind of an informal assessment, maybe they might contribute more. I don't like forcing people to go into chat, so it's kind of a mixed bag. But, you know, informal assessment, I think, is going to be more and more prevalent in the future, uh, online especially, but even in person. It's, there's just too many ways to fake it when you're doing a test. And I think that that's a long-term problem that, you know, moving online might actually eventually address. Um, you know, another thing with assessment and moving online is, uh, as OECD, OECD says, there's a risk of proliferation of certificates. There needs to be a regulation, etc. cetera. Uh, I love the idea that there are, will be multiple certificates from multiple 
um, organizations. Uh, at the same time, it's like open content, right? There, there needs to be uh, some kind of vetting, some kind of, of quality assurance. Hybrid learning. Hybrid learning is the mixture of learning online and offline. Now, we talked already about the inadvisability of teaching a class online and offline at the same time. Not recommended. Don't do it. <laughs> if somebody defines hybrid learning as some people are attend class in person while others join from home, tell them no. Uh, that's not what hybrid learning really means. What hybrid learning really means is that you do some things online, you do some things offline. Uh, you know, uh, if a person is attending an online session, I think from my experience is that uh, it's really important that everybody, um, everybody be online. We used to have these video conference meetings at NRC where I work and the main group would be in Ottawa and I'd be with a, an outlying group in New Brunswick and we'd participate by video conference. Or more accurately, we'd sit in a room reading our email while a video conferencing screen played. They never paid attention to us because we were the remote people, we didn't count. So uh, there you go. Uh, can you give an example of an informal assessment? Um, uh, you encourage your, your student to write a regular series of blog posts. In the case of language learning, you'd ask them to write them in that language. Now, you're not marking these, especially, you know, you're not marking them, but you're reading them and you're offering feedback. So it's more of a formative assessment. Um, but also you as an instructor, by reading them, uh, are able to come to a conclusion, a general statement, not a grade, but a general statement, this person is showing improvement, this person isn't showing in person improvement. You see what I mean? That's what I mean by informal. Time check, three minutes to go. Email communication with the students. Yeah, perfect, exactly. Because you can tell, right? If uh, you know, if you're emailing with a student and you're emailing in English and they're emailing you back in English and they're learning English, you can tell whether their English is getting better. Uh, okay. I was on hybrid learning, which we've said really should be not doing the two in the same classroom. Uh, the other thing is, and this is less relevant to you, but it's something I want to point to, digital learning in the classroom uh, is something that is becoming more prevalent. But again, right, this isn't about having people in the classroom and people learning remotely. It's like having people in the classroom do digital stuff while they're in the classroom. And that's that's perfectly fine. It's, it's the flip side of having people um, do stuff, you know, outside the digital classroom in their home or in their community. Uh, that's the talk. Uh, at the end of these slides, and these slides will be available to you, are some resources. This article from Tony Bates, I drew a lot from that. Uh, the OECD thing I talked a bit about. The World Bank is a wonderful set of examples of how different countries are using ed tech uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the Brookings Institute thing is a little one-sided, as it always is from Brookings, but I, I found it was a pretty good set of, uh, uh, of lessons learned. The Royal Society, uh, that's the Royal Society, but they're still, they, again, they still had some useful tips. The UNESCO document, uh, that's the one with all the videos that I was going to play here. And then something from Blogger, Damien Radcliffe, um, some takeaways. Uh, again, these will all be available to you, um, or they're also available, and uh, I created something called uh, creating, um, creating an online community class or conference quick tech guide. I'll just pop the link to that in the session here. And if you want to learn about any tools, etc., 
uh, just go to that link and I know I'm zipping through it. It covers all the tools that you could possibly need um, and, and offers you a little bit of instruction on each. So that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the session um, and I hope I'm finishing on time. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's been both uh, entertaining and informative. So we really appreciate you joining us this morning. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure to do this. Great. Thank you.